Luton certainly made a game of this tonight. 22 shots apiece. That's actually the most that Luton have ever had in a Premier League game. But Manchester United getting 10 on target to Luton's four. Much higher expected goals uh, number as well. They did uh, squander one or two chances, went through on goal in that second half. But in the end, uh, they didn't need to add to those two they scored in the first seven minutes from Rasmus Hoyland. He is an impressive young man, isn't he? After such a difficult start to his Manchester United career, certainly in terms of the Premier League, didn't score in any of his first 14 Premier League appearances. But goodness me, the tide has turned for him and very fast. Seven in six games. He's the youngest player in Premier League history to score in six consecutive Premier League matches. And I'm choosing my words carefully because, as you can see, Rasmus Hoyland <laughs> is making his way to join us now. Rasmus, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Congratulations. Thank you. Give us your perspective on the game, which you had a brilliant start to. Yeah, like you said, um, a good good beginning. Uh, two good and fast goals. And uh, then we drop off a little bit. We get uh, unfocused and they get one back. And then we know uh, with this crowd and this pitch and this atmosphere and 2-1 is always oh, not a... It's a dangerous uh, yeah, result and um, yeah, then we, we go to the break and I think actually we create a lot of chances in the second half, we just need to score, I have one as well and uh, yeah, a little bit uh, annoyed by that. Let me ask you about what you've talked about, the, the atmosphere, the pitch, the surroundings, did you find it quite a unique experience? Um, yeah, we know that every, every away ground in, in the Premier League can be very... Um, yeah, the presence is is, is immense, um, but we we have to deal with it. We are Manchester United, so um, I think we we got a little bit lucky today. But uh, all that matters is uh, the three points. We've got uh, the goals that you scored to show you, Rasmus, on the screen. You can have a look. So the first one comes up to 37 seconds. Yeah. What were you thinking? This, at this is point? nice, Rasmus, because we, what we noticed at half time is you gamble. Look at your position there, and then you just have that anticipation. You smell something might happen. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I thought that this could be something and uh, I already knew that I was going to go past him when uh, I, have, I have a lot of speed, so just track it to my left foot and then go past him and uh, yeah, put it in the back of the net. But you kind you of made it very easy. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes and no. Uh, I was a little bit uh, unsure of, uh, of the touch because um, I thought that it was maybe going to go a little bit too short, but uh, in the end it was a good call. And the second goal, Rasmus, uh, we, were too, we were doing analysis at half-time. Personally, the three of us, the pundits, said absolutely you meant it. The presenter, not so much. <laughs> but we were convinced that you meant this. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Thanks, I, I think you can see it kind of... Um, I turn my body there and then just flick it in. Uh, well, that's an incredible yeah. reaction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, I was, uh, I was surprised. Uh, that was such a good goal, to be fair. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I've, I've actually tried to train, not, not, not finish like this, but like shoulders and just, you know, when you do kickoffs and stuff, and you just yeah. juggle a little Beautiful. bit with the ball. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, also at the moment um, have a lot of confidence. So yeah, it goes in. You talk about confidence. You. Came to the Premier League, lots of money, expectation. You didn't score in your first 14 games. Did you ever doubt yourself? No, I never doubted myself. But of course, you can be a little bit down when you when you're not scoring in the Premier League, um, especially when when you're that young and, and the expectation is that high. But I always believed in myself. I scored a lot of goals in, in the Premier League, uh, in the in the Champions League as well. So and it was just a matter of time. Keep working on on, on my finishing and my confidence doing in training and uh, yeah, learning my teammates, getting the the understanding of um, where to position myself, whether right back or the left back or Rashi Ghana, or Anthony, whomever playing on the on the wing and with Bruno as well. We see the way you work and, and obviously we admire the way you work. Jamie made a really good point. We're looking at all of your kits on the pitch. Everyone else has got pristine white kits. Your kit is muddy as anything. And that tells us that not only have you got the quality to score the goals that you've scored, <laughs> but you give a good shift. And against a team like this, how important are you to your team with the way you put your body yourself and put yourself about? Yeah, uh, I always try to do my best. Uh, I always, yeah. Um, 
try to put the um, also when when we are in front of the goal I try to do the the, the extra pass to, to 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 win the game I think the most important is to to get three points uh, even though I also want to score I know that's part of my game as well but uh, yeah uh, I take the fights uh, whatever I will do to to get the the three points in the end and how much is it helping you you, you mentioned some of your teammates but certainly for the last few games when this scoring run has, has been happening you've had Alejandro Gonacho on one side you've had Marcus Rashford the other side you've had Bruno Fernandes behind you is, is that helping you in your game yeah 100 percent it's quality players uh, I play for probably one of the biggest clubs in the world so it's it's quality players I, I train and play with every day um, especially the guys I have around me I'm uh, I'm very happy for them and uh, yeah I just want to keep uh, playing with them and, and get even better and uh, hopefully they can also get better and we can be and we can grow together and we're saying it because you've won four on the bounce now in the Premier League that momentum is building do you feel that of course uh, this was massive today uh, Closing an even closer gap to, to, to Spurs, who lost uh, some points as well. And uh, Villa and Spurs have each other, uh, I think, maybe next round already. And uh, yeah, uh, then again, uh, we need to keep pushing. Uh, it's our target to, to get the, the Champions League football and uh, yeah, go uh, as far in, in, in the FA Cup as well. We need to, to remember that. It's very important for us to win trophies. So um, we will do everything possible to, to, to go and uh, win everything. Four straight wins, seven and six. Congratulations, thank Rasmus. Well you. done. And thank you for coming to speak to us as well. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. Well done, mate. I don't know. What to... <laughs> we got it right that time. <laughs> and the laundry wants to have a word as well. <laughs> you're right. You're right, Curtis. He's, he's put his, his, um, his tracksuit top on now, but he was absolutely filthy head to toe. Does that make a difference? Your assessment of somebody? Well, I think if, if, you're, a, if you're a centre half and you see that he's willing to go the way he does and similar to Carlton Morris as well, it's, whether they have a good game or not, it's always going to be a difficult game for you because they put themselves about whether his touch is off or not. He's always going to, every single header, you get that slight bump. Every single time the ball goes in the box, he's making three, four runs. And I love the way he spoke as well. He, he spoke about, you know, I make these runs, I do these things for the team. So talking about that 14 games drought where he didn't score, he's still running about for the team, still worked hard. And now he's getting his rewards from, from what he's done. Unbelievable pressure for a young man. You know, from not just the price tag going to Manchester United, the expectation. If you think back to many years ago when Man United were, were dominating, they had York, um, Solskjaer, Cole, um, Van Nistelrooy, whoever. Sheringham, whoever. They could bring on forwards, uh, a, a, an abundance of forwards to change the team and change maybe the way things are going. He's had to play pretty much every game because they needed him. And when he had that little run of form, you were, we were questioning him. I have to be totally honest, I'm not just saying it, I, I didn't have any doubts. You could see the quality. If you can score goals in the Champions League, you can certainly score goals in the Premier League. And I like what he does. He's very good into, the, into his feet. He uses his body extremely well. Tom, you said it before the game and you proved exactly right. And that's happened in this match today. Yeah, I couldn't agree uh, more with you both. It's, he's one of them strikers that you know you're in for a tough day with and you can't switch off because he's always on the move. He's always looking to get in behind. And he's one of them players, he doesn't just have the pace in behind, he can hold it to feet and he can give you that nudge when you're not expecting it to put you off. Um, so you've always got to be on your game and yeah, he was, um, he was a real handful tonight. Is the pace the most worrying thing when you're facing him up as a centre-half? No, I don't think so. Okay. It's, if you look at Gabe Osho today, he, he couldn't go too tight because he's strong enough to roll you but you've got to give him that couple of yards because he's, he's quick enough to, to go in behind as well. So he's, he's one of them where you've got, you're almost guessing as um, you've got to try and read the ball into him. And then when he takes a touch, maybe then try and pressure him. But if you, if you gamble too tight, he can roll you because he is that strong. Mm. This, this front three, Jamie, that I mentioned to, to Rasmus, he acknowledged it well. His answer was, you're playing at Manchester United, you're going to have high quality players around you. Yep. But is it this consistency of selection that's helping, that's helping these three front players really form this unit, which as you can see, the numbers are leaping, goals per game up in the last seven games with them, 2.4. Eight in the previous 18 games, only one. That re win ratio as a result is climbing and the points per game speaks for itself. Absolutely, and the manager deserves credit for that because he paid 80 million for, for Anton and he's not playing him, but he realises they've got better players that are actually starting and making things happen. It's a, it's a, it's a front three that possesses a lot of quality, a lot of pace, goals, and I think especially with Hoyland because he's the focal point in that. At times at the start of the year, he looked like he was not apologetic, but he wasn't enjoying the, the, the pressure that what it is to play for Man United now. He even stood there. He's got that confidence. He's got his shoulders back and he's like, I'm here. I, I look great in this kit. 
and he was absolutely phenomenal today. And he deserves it because he took an enormous amount of stick. And you can imagine how he felt, you know, at night when he wasn't scoring goals, questioning himself. But you see, he's a very confident well, young man. I think he'll be better for that. Going through that absolutely. adversity without scoring, with the pressure that he had coming in, to get through that and now come out the other side, I think uh, in the long run he'll, uh, he'll thrive off that. Absolutely. There was absolutely no doubt that he meant that second goal. <laughs> well, listen, you, I saw what you did earlier on with my mate Harry Styles. Styles. Yes, yeah, so I, I think we call that one all now. Does the, does the manager actually, Curtis, as well, deserve a little bit of credit here? Because a lot of people are very quick to, to criticise Eric Ten Hag, but he saw danger at half time. Yellow card for Harry Maguire just before the whistle, yellow card for Casemiro. Didn't take any risk there, took them both off. I think Casemiro particularly was the one that needed to come off. Obviously, we spoke about half time. He'd made several fouls, got a yellow, and then that second yellow that he should have got was was very touch and go. So he he had to come off. Harry Maguire was a consequence of Casemiro's yellow card in the fact that Casemiro just let Ross Barkley run past him. So I think Johnny Evans coming on was fantastic. I think the way yeah. that Manchester United set out their stall, they played in that mid to low block, and defended, and and ultimately they played on the counter attack. Like I said, they out Luton Town, Luton Town. They played on the counter-attack, should have, with all due respect to Luton, they should have been 4-5-1 up with the chances on the breakaway. But once they don't do that, Johnny Evans steps up and, and he defends like he does and he has done for years. I think he looked better than Mayno playing as that defensive midfield player second yeah. half anyway than Casemiro. He's taking too many risks, trying to win the ball. It was all too, all too quick for, it, for him in there. Chung was picking up in good positions from Luton's point of view. He didn't seem to be mobile enough to do that. But Mayno has that sort of that youthfulness about him and that extra presence. And he looks like he's the real deal in that position. He'll be having coffee and two watermelon sugars right now. I'm joking, <laughs> nice. Yes, guys, come on, you just come I don't deserve that, Gary. <laughs> I couldn't think oh. of any more Harry Styles songs. <laughs> Gary, welcome. You've joined us. You satisfied with what you've seen today? Yeah, I think United deserve to win. I think second half performance was probably better in more measure than the first half. The first 10 minutes were fantastic, but then for 30 minutes, I thought Luton could have scored you know, two or three goals themselves. In the second half, Luton's last part of the game let them down in the final third, but I thought United defended pretty well. I thought Evans and Varane positioned themselves well on those crosses. Um, and obviously the four one-on-ones, I think Ganacho had one, Hoyland had one, and I think Fernandes had two big chances. But, you know, the four, between those four, they should have at least taken one of them. Do you take encouragement for the way they, they sort of handled, managed the second half today? Yeah, I thought they actually were saying, I thought they were professional in the second half. I thought they were a lot better in their performance, more measured. Um, first half, they just went, I mean, they lost the discipline. You know, Maguire and Casemiro have had to be hooked at half-time. Uh, and they were all over the place at times. And you just thought, how can they go from here to there within half the games? Well, that's what they are. They are inconsistent. But I think Ten Hag will be a lot happier in the second half with his performance, even though they didn't score. Let's have a look at what Manchester United have uh, got to come, their immediate challenges. And, and remember, we're talking about this in the context of potential Champions League football again next season. Uh, this is how it looks, their next six. Fulham at home, then uh, Nottingham Forest in the cup before the Manchester derby. Ideally, they want to get unscathed to that point, don't they? No, I think what they'll look at that Manchester derby as is obviously it'd be just a game where everyone has to go into it. You know, most teams get beat against City away, but Tottenham play Villa, I think, in two weeks as well. So they'll see it as a little bit of a cancellation of that. I think what they'll do is they'll look around those games, though, and think they can win. I mean, you couldn't get a more friendly run of games than you've got other than that City game, which I think, like I say, that's just a freak game that everyone has during the season. Jamie, are they forcing their way into the conversation for the top four, do you think? Absolutely, yeah, of course. They're absolutely in that mix right now. And they've just got to make sure, as Gary mentions, that Man City game, that whatever way it goes, you don't let it finish your season if you don't get a result or if you get something that can give you that momentum. But they've got, they're playing well. They've got confidence. They've got a real belief at the moment. There's a bit more excitement about the club. And they're a lot more enjoyable to watch. Good to see you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just break off from that conversation because the man in that picture, Eric Ten Hag, has just joined us pitch side here at Kenilworth Road. And here he is. Congratulations, Eric. What's, what are your um, thoughts about the performance, first of all? Uh, it could have been an easy game after, um, say, 10 minutes. But in the end, it, uh, it was a difficult game because we didn't take the chances and then we allow them to get back in the game. Well, first of all, you must have been thrilled with the start you made. Two up after seven yeah. minutes. Uh, well, very good. But then after, I think with Canaccio and um, and Resi, we had big chances. Had to make three and four nil. And then I think we dropped too deep. Well, we we let them or we allowed them to get back in the game. Uh, we didn't close the half spaces where they they passed the balls in. 
and, and then our centre half has to come out. We allow them then shots and crosses, and yeah, you get difficult. But uh, second half as well, uh, we didn't take the chances, and there were so many and big chances. Eric, you scored two goals in the first half, but were you happier with the performance in the second half? The more measured, you were more measured in the second half. I thought. I think second half we should have scored. Uh, where, um, I think with uh, and Bruno and Carnaccio and Rashford, there were not say so opportunities. There were 100% chances, and definitely one has to go in, and then you make your life easy. Now we kept them in the game. What, what, at half time, when you took off Casemiro and Harry Maguire, obviously they were on bookings. What, were you certain you should take them off, or were you thinking, should we leave one on, maybe take one off? How, how well, were you approaching uh, it? I, I saw the reaction from the refereeing on it, and my thought was, yeah, maybe with the next one, uh, they, they will, would go off, and I wouldn't take that risk. And as well, because we have been Scott McTominay and Johnny Effians, we have good replacement, so don't go into the, in that risk. Uh, take them off and yeah, I think it was the right decision uh, because also you see the performance from both was very good. So do you go away really happy that you've got a win or, or do you go away Eric more concerned that having had seven shots in that first 13 minutes, Luton then had 10 on your goal? As I say, I think we, we are dropping too deep and uh, it was too easy going, we lose a little bit focus. Uh, that's the, uh, but maybe because it was so easy in the first 10 minutes and you score twice and then you see uh, with, with some players uh, they go uh, a little bit less and you can't afford this definitely not against uh, a side as Luton Town because uh, uh, I analysed them when they lost their games they only lost twice with two goals difference and the last weeks they are really in an uh, up uh, trend so uh, you have to be be ready, you have to be 100% focused, and that is uh, something I think we lost after 10 minutes. Eric, I want to ask you about Rasmus Hoyland. When he first came, obviously struggled in the Premier League, was scoring goals in the Champions League. How difficult was you, as, for you as a manager to keep him going, to keep his confidence up, and how proud are you now of what he's achieving right now? Uh, it was one of the things where we uh, recruited him on, on his character. And I knew he's a very strong character, uh, really. He, although he's uh, uh, 20, 21 now, he, uh, he can really perform under stress. And that is one uh, of the big skills you need as a Man United striker. And he, he doesn't get uh, nervous uh, or lose uh, confidence when he's not scoring. But of course, it would have helped. For instance, when he, the first game he came in against Arsenal, 100% penalty, he didn't, he didn't get. Then against Brighton, the game after, he scored a goal and he didn't get. Uh, because when you have to get into a new league, in a new team, especially in a big club, uh, then you want to build uh, quickly that confidence. Uh, because of, it will help. Once you are in the run, you see it. And now he's scoring, he touched the ball and he's in. And I think that's the way he is now. He's, he has a lot of confidence and I'm sure he will score even more. Eric, do you feel like the form that you're in now, that you're back in Champions League form, obviously last season you achieved Champions League football, you're getting closer to Villa, <laughs> to Tottenham all the time. Do you feel like the bit between the teeth is there now? I think we are back in the race and we, we're building momentum. And now we have to keep this going. We have to work on, keep working on our game and build the pressure on them. And um, yeah, we have to go from game to game. Every game is first a final eh, to get closer. Um, get closer to them and make more distance uh, to the teams uh, who are behind, uh, behind us. In the meantime, there seems to be an awful lot happening off the pitch as well, Eric. The speed of change that we read about with the partial takeover led by Sir Jim Ratcliffe. We read as well that Dan Ashworth is, is the number one choice to be the sporting director and the, a rebuild of a recruitment team as well. Do you support all that change? Uh, I have very good contact. I know what's going on. Um, so uh, I think for Man United, uh, it's very good uh, that uh, we built a strong organization. Uh, they are highly ambitious. Uh, so uh, good people are always welcome uh, because uh, it's teamwork by the end of the day. And we need good people in and the right strategies. Uh, you see with Ineos coming in, uh, they're spreading high ambitions. And that is think, what belongs to Manchester United uh, because uh, I think we are in the project and they can help us, they can support us uh, to accelerate this project. All right, Eric, we look, wish you luck with all of that and for this run to continue. Thank you very much for joining You're us. You're welcome. Congratulations. You're welcome. Okay.
Four wins out of four, and we are back in the race, says Eric Ten Hag, who leaves us. He's um, got to be happy with another victory chalked off here this afternoon at Kenilworth Road. Gary, your thoughts on, on what he had to say? I think you can feel that you know, he doesn't give a lot away at Ten Hag, but you can see that he's a lot more confident in his team and that they're a lot in a lot better place. I think he'll fancy they'll get to top four. I think he'll really fancy hunting down Tottenham and Villa. And I think they'll be feeling the pressure a little bit. I'm not saying they'll get there, but I think you can see there's a little bit of the bit between the teeth. I use the word momentum. It's huge in football. They're the team that everyone's looking at now. They're on a good run. And I think this run has certainly helped him. If you look at Chelsea and, you know, with Mauricio Pochettino, sometimes you've got to give managers time. Because I remember talking after the Tottenham game, you looked at where they were and the frustrations of how they were playing. He's fallen on a team now. There's a bit of confidence. There's a bit of belief in how they're playing. Players are like enjoying themselves again. And that's so important. And that I look at them and think, I'm sure like Tottenham are going, looking over their shoulder now and Aston Villa as well. So they're right in that race. Who looks vulnerable, Curtis? Because if Manchester United are going to force their way in, then someone has to drop out. Well, it, I think um, with, with Aston Villa and their European aspects, that's going to play a big part. Um, Aston Villa also squad depth, you know, you question if, if they were to lose one of their bigger players, how do they replace that player? I think Tottenham have been a bit hit and miss lately, obviously after a fantastic start. So I think the pair of them are vulnerable. It's just about what Manchester United do. They've obviously had a good run now, but it's about them continuing that. And obviously we've seen the run of games that are coming up. Other than Manchester City, you'd fancy them to win every single one of those games. And if you go and win all those games, and that's going to put it right, right to the wire. And the bigger picture for Man United now is not, it's not just this season, it's, it's the future. With what's happening at Liverpool, there's going to be, there has to be disruption. Jurgen Klopp's leaving, one of the best managers in their history. So whoever comes in, it's not going to be easy. Now, Man United have to be in a position to strike, to make sure that they are in the mix. Who knows what happens to Man City in the next couple of years with the you know, regularities, with the, you know, the financial, etc. They have to be the club that we've always spoken about in the Premier League and their history. And if they get everything right, and it does feel a lot more positive off the field, it really does. I can sense it now. There's no reason why. And they have to be ready to strike because there's going to be change at Liverpool, whatever way we look at it, in terms of how, how successful they are. When, when you look at the fact that, look, it was getting to the point whereby Manchester United analysts were getting mocked for always mentioning the Glazers when you lost a football match. It was getting to the point where you said, well, Glazers don't play football. But when you think for 10 years, every Manchester United manager has operated without a CEO that's actually been in a football club before, without a sporting director, without a known head of recruitment, it's madness. I mean, forget negligence, it's just madness. The idea that obviously Jim Ratcliffe's come in and just appointed a CEO that's been at a football club before and a football director, we're all thinking, well, that's... It's staggering it hasn't happened. It's unbelievable. It would never happen at any other club. So I think what we're seeing now is just normality. It's not sort of anything special at the moment. Just putting good people into the best, one of the best clubs in the world is a sensible thing to do. And that's why it feels like there's a new energy about the place. And actually, the, 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 the run... The turn in uh, Manchester United's fortunes has coincided at the point where Jim Ratcliffe came in. That, Do you that, think that is coincidence? Well, I think it might be a little bit of a coincidence, but you remember that sort of second 45 minutes against Aston Villa on Boxing Day, which damaged Villa. You know, Unai Emery will really be damaged by the two Manchester United games because they played really well in both games and they hammered United in the first half. But United were breathtaking in that second half and that was Jim Ratcliffe's first game, as it were, because he'd been announced on Christmas Eve. So it has been an about turn because I think what's happened then is, I think what Jim Ratcliffe has done, he's come in and said to all of them, look, I'm looking at every single one of you lot. You're all playing for your future. Gary, do you feel that there's almost been like a neg negligence of the brand Manchester United? So in terms of, because of how well Manchester United is going to sell worldwide, you know, they're going to sell shirts, they're going to do this, that the Glazers were just happy for it to tick along as it was. Do you know, the more I think about it, I think what the Glazers have done is they've just literally shown blind loyalty to people who've been really good to them over a long period of time at the club. Because, you know, Ed Woodward was at the club for 10, 15 years, or 10, 12 years before, obviously, he became CEO. He was there, obviously, working on the commercial side. And he's been very, you know, they're very, they've been very loyal to him and they believed everything that he said. And I'm sure Ed believed what he was doing as well. Yeah. And honestly, I said it probably 10 years ago, it's a little bit like they were playing football manager. We can just literally go and have a look at sort of some of the best players in the world, Di Maria, Falcao, Ibrahimovic. And they've literally played football manager with the club for 10 years without having serious people operating the club, which obviously other clubs have. It's yeah. unbelievable. Do you, yeah, do you think, Tom, that, that players' mood, the, 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 the training ground mood, can get affected by the, the machinations and the politics of, of a football club? Yeah, of course it can. Like, the fans can sit there and say, oh, it's, it's 11 v 11 at the end of the day, but what goes on in a week can have a massive effect come the, come the weekend. So, yeah, people can say it can't, but for sure it can.
I'm, I'm, I must be old school because I'm not sure how much what's happened with Ineos coming in has, ma has made a difference to how Hoyland's playing oh. or the difference that he's made by, but by settling the mood, isn't it? By settling the front three. I don't. I just. There never, is, is, I there, is there not I, a feel-good factor there, around? There the is, football but club. the feel-good factor is created by the players on the pitch right now, and that's what Hoyland's done. He's done that on his own, and he's scoring goals, and he's well, got. Well, he, he said to me that 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 unit yeah, is yeah, helping but him. The front, but that, that's not because Jim Rackley's playing left wing. That's because he's got the players and the way that they're playing right now. I'm talking about going forward. It's certainly, I don't yeah. disagree that that can help to get the right He may stability. have got a game, you know, a few months ago, Jim Rackley's <laughs> on left wing. I think he could have played on that wing, yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, the other thing, Jamie's right in some ways, they have got the players back. I mean, Casemiro's yeah. out for a long time. They had players out in sort of key positions. So there's an element of that, but I do believe the mood has changed. Yeah, well, I think it's a the, bit the, of the, both. The mood, the mood yeah. is, you know, for instance, the pro... What, what the fans wanted, what everybody connected with United wanted, was just some interference with the just complete and utter tosh that we've seen for 10 well, years. There, <laughs> and, and actually, what's happened is that the, the boardroom has been disrupted, which means that there's a complete new energy with decisions being made. There's that a new chief everyone, executive, Gary Inoma Barada. Hey, there long, is potentially a sporting director. Hey, but let, you, let me ask you about him. How long have I been asking for you just have a, for an you awful know, long a time. CEO that loves football, a sporting director, a sporting department. I can yeah. show up now about it, because one's come, <laughs> they've got a department that's come in. Well, let me ask you this about Dan Ashworth then, because he's still Newcastle's sporting director. There could be a, an element of compensation needed to prize him out. I've seen some reports today <laughs> suggesting that, that Newcastle should charge 50, 60 million pounds to get him out. What would you pay? What is it worth to get a good sporting I mean, director out? I don't of a know. Big I don't. Club? I mean, I don't know if Dan's got something in his contract. I don't know how it works with sporting directors. To be honest with you, how you release them, I would expect it's more of a normal employee type situation when you've got a sporting director. I can't think. I mean, look, he's not going to be able to walk out for free. He's not going to be able to walk out and work at United but, but tomorrow. He'll you, have he'll have some sort of restrictions against him. Would you pay his... more to make sure he could start straight away rather than go on gardening leave for sport, twelve months? If that's the sporting director that they want and they want him to start straight away, he will have restrictions. Dan Ashworth to not be able to work at another club in the same space for twelve months. I'm sure of that now Manchester United might say we can't wait that long so we'll pay for it and um, I would say it's a, an absolute it's imperative that Manchester United for the next transfer window get someone in place because if you pay 10 million to get Dan Ashworth out if you get another transfer window wrong you might blow another 100 million so it's important they get the right people in place Dan Ashworth has done incredibly well at West Brom he did a fantastic job with England putting the foundation in place not just for the first team that have been successful but the youth teams and obviously the other side of, uh, of all the FA then he's done I was I was amazed he went to Brighton I thought Dan is that not a little bit of a sort of not, not backwards step but sideways step? but what he did there was fantastic he's been really sensible and measured at Newcastle what Manchester United need to do is stop the rot when Manchester United were phoned or Manchester United phoned any club in Europe they were going, here we go, it's bingo time, we're going to get paid a load of money. Dan Ashworth won't allow that to happen. He's, he, you know, he's quite sort of, if you like, resilient around that type of stuff and measured. One more on this. I, I thought it was interesting hearing from Eric Ten Hag that he was very much part of these conversations. It, it feels like he's been saying this all the way through this, that he knows everything that's happening, he's part of the conversation. Are you encouraged that he is part of that oh, conversation? He absolutely should be part forward? of the conversation. Honesty is absolutely important imperative in any business and the thing was if you remember Eric Ten Hag like Mourinho like um, Van Gaal like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer became head of recruitment last summer he became head of recruitment for the club do you think he still wants to be I, I wouldn't think he would I think he just want people in there that he trusted if a manager believes in the system around him of the players that are coming in you know Pep Guardiola's got Bagheerestein at, um, at Manchester City and he will trust him with his life to bring in players that, f that align with what they need. What Ten Hag will look at and think is, the people that were at United, who've signed badly for 10 years, are still there, and I need some sort of competent people. I think if Dan Ashworth comes in, he'll step aside and let him get on with it. He were on the front foot, and Rob was on the front foot as well, because he, he was pretty happy with the performance and the game plan which the team were committed to. He said it didn't collapse. And then there's the issue of, of Casemiro. He said a telltale sign that he was withdrawn at half-time. Curtis, do you think he was... Manchester United were, were fortunate that he wasn't shown a red card? Yeah, we, we spoke about it. You know, if you're on the yellow, this, this one was, was a yellow, and it was about his full foul at this time. And then the, the, the next one that comes up, it's just one of those, because it's a bad touch that he reacts to as well, usually they're the ones that referees are quick to say, right, that's a yellow, but I think the referee, you know, each each individual tackle should be at his own merit, and I think that would be a yellow card if he didn't already have, have a yellow card. Gary? I, I don't think he could have complained, but, I mean, Casemiro gets sent off a lot. 
Um, he makes a lot of those challenges. He makes lots of fouls during the game and he always lives on the edge. And yeah, I, I thought he may come off. I was surprised Harry Maguire came off as well. I thought he might have been able to manage himself through the second half. How encouraged should Luton be by the performance? Not just today, I suppose, Tom, but on, on paper, as, as um, Rob was saying, you know, uh, losing last week against Sheffield United, but also having 20 shots last week, another 22 today against Manchester United. Yeah, I know we've lost the last two, but if you look at us from a whole from the start of the season, we've improved leaps and bounds. I mean, ultimately today, it's a sloppy start that cost us, a mistake in a set piece. And then we get back in the game and we can't control the counter-attack. You've got to have a bit more solidarity when you're attacking. You Look at United's front three. You can't be giving them, them that kind of space to run into. So um, that'll be the disappointing thing as well, because on another day they could have took um, a couple more of them. Surely showed plenty of enterprise going forward. Yeah, and I thought Carter Morris was, was superb today. He took his goal well there. Like we said, he was never going to pull out of that one. Um, but it's, we never really had that clear-cut chance where we thought, you know, it should have been a goal, not like the one-on-ones that United were getting into. Is there a little bit of what-if with the injury to Elijah Adebayo in the warm-up? Yeah, like I said, to lose anyone at that late stage is going to be difficult, but especially your, your top goal scorer. So, um, yeah, you, 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 you try your best to replace him, but what he brings, you know, he's six foot five, he's a handful, he can control it, he can bring people into play. You're going you're gonna to miss him for you've sure. You've worked on it all week as well, haven't you, Tom? Yeah, you've yeah. done it, you've done your pattern of play, you've done your set pieces, knowing that every time we get the right opportunity, the right delivery is going to be the focal point in that. And all of a sudden, it throws everything, you know, throws the plan right out the window. You have to adjust, you have to change it. You're bringing Cooley Woodrow and it gives you a different kind of profile. He wants it into feet more. You know, if you looked at Morrison and Adebayo at the front, it been a right nuisance all game. They'd have given you right to the edge where you set pieces, when the balls are coming in the box, but all of a sudden you haven't got him. It changes everything for you. So they've been in every single game that I've seen them. Every game. You know, last week was obviously a disappointing point in one against Sheffield United, but even then the chances they've had, they are... They're going to go really close. Whether they're going to have enough quality and time will tell, but they are going to go down. If they do, they go, what, not going to go down. They're going to, whatever they do, it's going to be a real fight and attitude about them. Well, the crowd were willing for the equaliser. We were just walking down the steps across the other side of the ground here when this corner came over. It's close, Curtis. Yeah, and I think they were, they were trying to claim it was a, a save by Onana. I think Onana would have been happy to claim it, but yeah, it's, it's obviously right at the very death. It's the, the one good corner that I actually put in and it's a great header from Barkley. You know, it's slightly behind him, does well to get it, get his head on it, but just not enough to, to go under the bar. Yeah, I think we'll be disappointed with the set pieces today. Obviously, one conceding and then two attacking as well. Is Everything just seemed to find Johnny Evans' head and he was heading everything out. That's the first time that we managed to get on the end of one and it looked like almost uh, could have gone in. What do you, you think is going to decide it for, for Luton Town? Jamie's sort of asking about the, the quality in the group. Ultimately, I think Ross Bartley is going to be massive. I know he's getting a lot of praise now. Him and Sambi and they have really added a different dynamic to us. I know we get labelled a lot with um, being too direct, but we've definitely got a different string to our bow now with them two playing midfield. We are able to mix it up. And like Jamie said, when Adebayo is fit, we can go direct if we need to. So, um, yeah, there's, there's different strings to our bow at the minute, but, um, yeah, keeping Ross and Sambi fit will be massive. You're in and around that dressing room at the moment, Tom. What is the, the feeling of these games coming up? Is there a real belief that you can stay up? Yeah, and there has been from the start. Well, some people might call us silly. I know pundits were saying we'd be down by Christmas. We just used that it as Gary. Sorry about that, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have words after. Everyone's getting one today, Gary. Don't worry, I like them as well. <laughs> were you surprised by the quality they showed at times and the, and the amount of football they also played? Yeah, well, I was. I mean, look, it doesn't surprise me that every team that I watch against Manchester United seems to play better football than them in terms of patterns of play, combinations, keeping the ball. And that's what happened for the sort of last half an hour of the first half. Even in the second half, they did play good football, but they got counter-attacked a lot on the second half. I do agree with what Tom just said and Jamie mentioned about the attacking set pieces. I think they obviously need to be more of a threat on that. But to change the game plan, you've lost your six foot five centre forward yeah. Yeah. and that forced them to play more football. And that meant then that probably then you know, you play more football, you're more likely to give the ball away and get counter-attacked on. And that's what happened. It played into United hands, Adebayo, not being there in more ways than one. It's been a long day, Tom. It's been emotional at times as well. How have you found it? I've really enjoyed today, actually. Yeah, I've had a great day, thank you. Good. Well, it's been brilliant having you with us. Just just remind everyone, if there have been people joining late on, exactly where you are now and, and what the next few weeks and months look like for you. Um, 
yeah, no, I'm in a positive, positive mind space. Um, yeah, I've been positive since since it happened, really, and um, taking every day as it comes. I know it's the old cliche, but um, got a baby on the way, so I got that to look forward to, and um, and yeah, um, just listening to medical advice from then. We're going to follow every step, of course, along the way. We wish you luck with the, the pending new arrival as well. And perhaps you've got a new best mate as well, Harry Styles, who's, who's here today. <laughs> I think he's yours. <laughs> you can share him. You can share him with me. <laughs> That's enough uh, late night talking from us. It was 2-1 pretty early on, and it finished as it was. We're off to Harry's house. <laughs> Bye from us.